Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Get out your King James Bibles. We're going to go through another section of denying the lowercase w word leads to denying the capital W word. Okay? And today our example is King Saul. First I want to have you turn to Titus 1.16. Okay, this is what kind of hit me and then it's like got me to start doing this study. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Hopefully you're not catching that, but sometimes vehicles will be driving by. Uh, had some hummingbird uh, fighting each other right there. Um, I've attempted this video, this study this is the third attempt. Okay, First two attempts I did standing up, got sunburned. Uh, first one, the file got corrupted. The second one, I was just cranky and uh, didn't really like uh, some of the things I said in there. Um, so today, I've been praying. It's going to be a hot day today. Um, so I want to get through this study with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, first, I want to say my prayer goes out to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, today, not today, today, but in these last days, it just seems like we're having struggles with ourselves, our flesh. We're having struggles with the body of Christ. We're having struggles with the lost world. Uh, the cares of this world um, and there's a lot of things that are trying to distract us from these studies brothers and sisters Christ from standing for the Word of God which is what this study is about and living the Word of God okay? to make sure that we are not denying the real Jesus Christ that's found in the King James Bible okay? so uh, turn to 1st Samuel 15 7 they profess that they know God but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. So everything they do do that lines up with Scripture is worthless. Okay, they're on their way to hell. They deny the real Jesus Christ. Okay? Sometimes they can do things. It's in these last days, just kind of going off a little bit on a tangent, but in these last days, some people can work really hard to try to look, you know, try to line up with this book to put on a show, but eventually their true selves are going to come out. It might not come out right away. But there's always going to be red flags. God's always going to show you something that doesn't seem to fit, something that doesn't seem to set right. Um, okay? They profess that they know God, but you look at their works, uh, some of their works don't line up with the Bible. And then you start talking to them about those works and the works that don't line up with God, because some do, because it said here, and unto every good work, reprobate. He's, it's worthless. Okay? Their heart's not in the right place. They're not doing the good works lining up with Scripture for Jesus Christ. Why? Because in other works, they're denying Him. They're denying who He is. All right. 1 Samuel 15, 7. Let's go through and read about Samuel, and then I'm going to talk about three examples of somebody. When I read through this, it was like, really? Because we're going to get this. I'll get ahead of myself a little bit. We get this, but I am obeying the Word of God. And then when you show them the scriptures, they turn around and say, I am obeying the word of God, and then add to scripture, or take away from scripture. All right? But they have to add after they take away. All right? You get those people, this is what King Saul is all about, you get those people that are about, but I am obeying the word of God, but I am, and no matter how much scripture you show them, it's like a circle, it's like a loop, they're a broken record. I am obeying the word of God, I am, and no matter how much you try to show them scripture, it will never get through to them. Why? Because the Word of God's not down here. It's just head knowledge. 1 Samuel 15, 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah unto the thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people, and the people, Saul and the people, remember that. Saul later on is going to try to blame just the people. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatling and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. I want to stop there to say that's what I'm talking about when we read Titus 1.16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. There are times in people's lives that they like to put on a show of a changed life because they get out the things that, uh, that are vile and refuge and they destroy utterly. Things that are obviously wicked, you know, morals to the world, good morals and everything. They're obviously wicked. 
But what about the other things that they think is good, but the Word of God says, get it out of your life? You know, the best of the sheep? They said there, the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lamb. What about the stuff that God says, get it out of your life, stop doing it? But they look good and they're, st they're it's just innocent and everything. You see what I'm saying, brothers and sisters Christ? You'll have people, it's hard today, you got to be not quick to judge uh, when someone's struggling with sin. But when you got people who are justifying sin, they might try to say, I have a changed life. But what's their attitude towards sin as a whole? What's their attitude towards the commandment of God as a whole? If God says, don't do it, are they not doing it? Or are they still doing it? Okay, I just kind of off in a tangent when I was read that, I noticed how they threw away everything that was... They obeyed the Lord when everything was, you know, all the bad stuff, the bad, bad stuff. Okay, we'll get rid of that stuff. We'll obey the Lord there because, yeah, that is pretty bad. You know, murder, fornication, uh, some of this other stuff that's really serious sin. We'll get that out. But what about vain imagination? What about abstaining from all appearance of evil? What about drunkenness? So on and so forth. Well, we'll keep some of the good stuff that we think is good. God said, none of it's good. None of it's good. We're going to find out later. Get rid of all of it. None of it's good. That's what God commanded. They didn't do that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. I've always pushed this, brothers and sisters in Christ, that what Jesus are you following? There's Christians, the great falling away, it's not the great falling away, but it's the falling away. Um, the falling away is people that they're following the real Jesus Christ and they turn to start following the counterfeit Jesus of the world. They start going the way of the world. They stop following Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. The Jesus Christ that can be found in Scripture. Okay. It says that the he turned his back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. Remember what the word of God says, brothers and sisters of Christ. Jesus said, if a man love me, how many people out there claim to love Jesus Christ? Oh, I love Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. Are you keeping his lowercase w word, the perfect written word of God? King James Bible. That's where you find it for English speaking people. Okay. Are you obeying it? Well, no, no, I'm just going to I'm going to be like Saul here. We're going to get continue and look at Saul's excuses and everything. I'm going to be like Saul. I'm going to claim I'm obeying the word of God and and then I'm going to add to the word of God and then I'm just going to do my own thing and do what's popular with the world and what pleases the world. Then you don't love Jesus Christ. It's that simple. The Bible says there's no greater love than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. People like to stop there. Why don't you keep going? Ye are my friends if, it's a Bible if, you do whatsoever I command you. Is Jesus your friend? Oh yeah, Jesus is my friend. Are you doing whatsoever he commands you? I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'm staying from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Vain imagination, getting that out. Your heart is about the Lord continually, 100%. It's 100% about the Lord and not about the flesh anymore. Okay. Well, no, I don't really, you know, I think it's about based on opinions. What Bible I use, it's just, it's just about a preference and opinion. And, you know, and the, anybody who tries to justify sin and this and that, Jesus isn't their friend. What's the opposite of friend? Enemy. You can be a friend or you can be an enemy. You cannot be both. Okay? Saul turned from following God and he was not performing his commandments. He wasn't obeying the word of God, whether it was the spoken word or the written word. He wasn't obeying it. He wasn't obeying the command of God. Let's keep going. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. It grieved Samuel. Oh, come on, Saul, why did you do that? Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry for Saul. He's, I don't know why, and he's just grieving. We're going to find out later. He's grieving for Saul. Mm -hmm. Verse 12. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Sam... Let's see. And when Samuel rose early in the... 
to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Notice how he says, Blessed be thou of the Lord. The Bible talks about people with good words and fair speeches. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay? It's just supposed to be about love and peace and blessings, all these positive things. But they come out, and how many of you have had that someone say that? Bless you, brother. They tell you you're following a false plan of salvation, but they'll turn around and say, Bless you, brother. They basically say that you're, that you're lost. Some of them have gone as far as to say some of the brethren that are in ministry are servants of Satan, but they'll say, Bless you, brother at the end and it's like okay Saul knew what he did was wrong and he comes out and he says blessed be thou of the Lord blessings to you brother I have performed the commandment of the Lord this is where it first says but I am obeying the word of God you get this from these uh, professing Christians but I am obeying the word of God and brothers, sisters in Christ, as we go through this, I know I'm going to keep pointing it at false converts, but you need to also look at it for your own life to make sure you're not falling into the trap of being like this in any area of your life. That you're trying to hold on to sin and be one of those people, but I am obeying the Word of God. I believe a saved sinner can fall into this trap too. I've seen it among some of the brethren. All right? But he comes out and he says, but I am obeying the commandment of God. Verse 14, And Samuel said, What meaneth then these bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowering of the oxen which I hear? He basically just calls them out. That's what we do with people. What about the Word of God? What about this verse? What about that verse? Comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Not just grabbing one verse, but comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Okay. Now this is a simple command. Destroy everything. None of it's good. Destroy it all. Okay, simple command. Samuel didn't, uh, didn't follow it. Verse 15, And Saul said, what is, what's Saul's response? They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep, the people, remember it wasn't just the people, it was him too, but now he's shifting the blame to the people. The people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, thy God, what about our God, thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now he's throwing it on his shoulder. You got a problem with us sacrificing to the Lord? That's in Scripture. We're supposed to sacrifice to our Lord, but thy Lord. So now he went from saying, I am doing the commandments of God, to saying, I am doing the commandments of God. And then he adds to Scripture saying, well, God wants us to do this. We're supposed to sacrifice to the Lord. Okay? He's... To somebody who's simple, that's why I, I, I pray for the brethren that are truly saved, that are newly saved, that people come in and they'll throw verses out, and they'll throw little things out. Is Samuel someone who's newly saved? No. But could somebody who's newly saved go, well, yeah, I guess if we're going to sacrifice to the Lord your God, okay, that, that sounds about right. We're doing this for the Lord. We're doing it for the Lord. Let's go for it. They might have gone for it. But he was talking to somebody who had a personal relationship with God. Who knew God's word. Okay. That's who Saul's dealing with. And I've come across people who treat me like I don't know what I'm talking about because they think I don't know what I'm talking about, that I don't know the word, I'm not learned, I haven't studied the word, and they throw things out trying to deceive me. And when I throw verses back at them, what happens? They come back with adding to the word of God. Did they get God command him to kill only certain people and then keep the best of the sheep? And keep Agag. Notice he didn't even mention Agag the king, but you know, keep some of the sheep for sacrifice. Was that part of God's command? No. Saul just added to the word of God. First, he is abiding by the commandment of God. So then, in order to make it look like he's actually abiding, because he got caught, Samuel said, "Look, look." Well, now he's got to add to the word of God to make him still look like he's obeying the commandment of God. Okay, verse sixteen. <clears throat> Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, 
Was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and then the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto them, remember what we just read there, he was supposed to utterly destroy everything. And, Samuel, and Saul said to Samuel, this is Saul again, after he was just called out a second time, No, you're not obeying the word of the Lord. This is Saul's answer. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. How many times we come across people like that, brother and sister Christ, professing Christians that love the flesh and love the world, and when we try to preach scripture to them and tell them they're not obeying the word of the Lord, they keep coming back, but I am obeying the word of the Lord, just like Saul here. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The Agag the king is still alive. He didn't utterly destroy the Amalekites. 21. But the people took of the spoil, there he is blaming the people again, and sheep and oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. He's throwing it back in his face. We're doing this for thy God. What's your problem, Samuel? We are obeying the word of the Lord. At this point, you guys think, something's wrong with Saul. When I come across people in the comment sections, and I'm trying to have fellowship with someone who might be saved, because I don't judge right on the, on the bat, I'm cautious about calling someone a brother in Christ. But there's all these signs and everything that come out, and you're like, and you, some of these people, it's like, but you're not obeying the word of God. The word of God is clear as can be. The command that God gave Saul was clear as can be. There's no room for a, well, it could be this or it could be. It's just plain as can be. The plan of salvation is simple and it's plain and it's just as it is. There's no, well, we can interpret it this way or we can interpret it that way. And I've heard some of the dumbest things from professing Christians. Not I've said some dumb things as saved. I'm talking about dumbest things from professing Christians that are trying to justify their sin and try to get around repentance. You know when it says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrows of the world worketh death, the law of sin and death, um, the wages of sin is death. It's talking about hell. There's heaven and there's hell. The wages, uh, let's say, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, God's grace saving you. Now they're saying that godly sorrow there, I had someone say, well, that's God's, God's the one that's sorry. That's only something God can have. And I'm like... Where is this coming from? It's coming from King Saul's. That's what it's coming from. Right? They'll do anything they can to justify themselves, to make them out to be right, and no matter how much they have to pervert Scripture, change Scripture to make it look like, hey, I'm obeying Scripture. I am obeying Scripture. They'll do whatever it takes to justify their sin and still holding on to this world and rejecting Jesus, the real Jesus Christ. They end up rejecting the real Jesus Christ when they hold on to this world. When their sin is more important. We'll get to some verses that talk about that. Verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord in great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. He threw it right back in his face. The word of God. This was God's command. You think he cares about uh, you disobeying if you think he's, he I'm trying to say it right you think God's okay with you disobeying his command because you're doing the work of the Lord I'm disobeying God over here but as long as I'm obeying him over here that makes this disobedience okay uh, no it doesn't okay you're supposed to obey God across the board in every way shape and form you're supposed to obey his word period but I'm doing good works. These good works, you know, I'm doing it for the Lord. You know, I sing hymns and worship the Lord, and I do this for the What do you think God has more, thinks more important? Okay. Do you think uh, God thinks that all these things you're doing for Him, like gifts, things that you're doing to please Him, is more important than obeying His Word? Do you think that ultimately what you do of your own accord pleases God more, let's say it this way, than obeying His command? That you are, my, you are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, command you. Okay. Uh, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Well, let's, let's keep going here. 
What does Samuel say? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, than doing good works to become reprobate. That we read in First uh, Titus 1.16. And unto every good work, reprobate. They're disobeying God. And the most important things, the most important thing is obeying the gospel. We'll talk about that a little bit. These people that have this attitude that deny the true plan of salvation. But they refuse to obey the gospel, but they'll obey the word when it's, it's here, here, here. And they'll do this for the Lord, and they'll do this for the Lord. Their good works are reprobate. Because they end up denying the real Jesus Christ. The God who created them. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken to that... And to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and thy words. Notice he's saying what he's saying. I've, I've sinned. He's just making a statement. I've sinned. He got caught in a corner, backed into a corner. He sinned. And obeyed their voice, blaming the people again. So there you can see halfway through that he's not really taking full responsibility. I have sinned and I have obeyed their voice, the people's fault. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin. Stop for a second. Wait a second. He's asking Samuel to pardon his sin? And turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. He's going to go and sacrifice the animals and worship the Lord. Just continue doing what he was going to do to begin with. Well, if, if he's truly sinned, I mean, when you look at this, if he truly sinned, he'd turn and go, Okay, I'll, everybody, destroy all these animals. Kill them. Just destroy them on the spot. Lord, I have sinned against you by not doing it then. I'm going to do it now. Destroy them all. Hey, guy, get them over here. We're going to behead them. Kill him. But he didn't. He's like, I, I have sinned and transgressed against the commandment of God, but I'm going to continue doing what I'm going to do. He's going to continue doing what he was going to do to begin with. How many times you come across those people? You're right, but then they continue doing it. Well, then they don't really believe you were right when you quote scripture or the word of God is right. You know what I'm saying? How many have we come across those people, brother and sister of Christ? Verse 26, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. He rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord rejected him. Okay. Uh, Romans 16, 18, you don't have to turn there because I quoted it earlier, but that's the address. I'm bad with addresses sometimes. I quote scripture, but they're where they come, like the address, Romans, Titus, whatever. It's hard for me sometimes. But Romans 16, 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. He was still trying to deceive Samuel there towards the end. You just, I just want you to forgive me so you can come before me with the people to put on a good show that, hey, Samuel's still with me, so God is still with me, and I'm still obeying the God. I mean, it's just, the guy's completely brain dead, mentally ill. There's no other way to say it. Okay? But here's the thing. First he says, I'm obeying the commandment of God. Then he says, I'm obeying the commandment of God, and then justifies it by using other things that come by the words of, other words of God, you know, trying to make the Bible contradict almost but he has first he says I am obeying it then he says I am obeying it and uses uh, excuses then he comes back with but I am still obeying it <laughs> you know and then he can and he shows that he cares more about what the world thinks and the flesh thinks and in order to justify the flesh and the ways of the world he's got to add to or subtract from God's Word All right? and he keeps coming back with I am obeying the Word of God Now, this is going to be a long story, but I want to hit three, three things I want to talk about. Drunkenness that I've seen in my life. It's the, it, you can see this in other people's areas in your life, brothers and sisters of Christ. I mean, other areas in the Bible. But I pick three things where I see this a lot um, and that's recently in my life. Okay, 
with someone that was in my life recently, drunkard, we're going to talk about drunkenness, they used verses to try to say, I am obeying the word of God, and no matter how you talk to him, just like with Saul, it's just a circle. You just keep coming back to a circle. But I am, he comes back to, I am obeying the word of God. No, you're not. Oh, but what about this? No, you're not. Here's the word of God. And then it comes back to, I am obeying the word of God. And you have to stick to your guns. <laughs> I'm sorry, guns. You have to hold your sword, your weapon, and not back down. The word of God says this. And your excuses doesn't go, doesn't usurp the word of God doesn't overthrow the authority of Scripture by your excuses, by your traditions, by whatever. Okay? you got to stick to your guns, the Word of God, the sword. You make sure you're holding that sword and gripping that sword. Okay? Make sure that sword is sharpened. You're studying it. If you know the Word of God and you're living the Word of God and you stay in the Word of God daily, it's harder and harder for people to use fair words and good speeches to try to deceive you. People that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Saul was serving himself. He wasn't serving Jesus Christ. God manifest the flesh. God was there in the uh, Jesus was there in the Old Testament. He's God. Okay? He wasn't obeying the Lord. So let's talk about drunkenness. Drunkard. I used to slip up and I would say alcoholic. I'm still not against people saying alcoholic to a point, but I'm, I've been corrected by some brethren who really had problems with alcohol and they said I need to use drunkenness and I agree with them. Um, uh, if you slip up and say alcoholic, just take it, uh, be great, um, how do I say it, be humble when someone corrects you like I need to be humble when someone corrects you and says hey, you need to say drunkard because that's what the Bible talks about, drunkard, not alcoholic. Alcoholic is the worldly wor word, why don't we use the Bible word, drunkard. And I got corrected, and I agree we should use drunkard. But I'm not going to get on to somebody who says it. But I, like I said, another tangent. It always comes down to the heart, brothers and sisters in Christ. It comes down to the heart. What's their attitude when you correct them on it? When the brother corrected me on it, I was like, you're right. I need to use drunkard. So we're going to be using drunkard. But I will just let you know, I'm not above correction. I was corrected using the word drunkard, because the Bible uses drunkard. But let's, I'm going to quote two verses that this person that was in my life recently that was professing to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing person, right, they would use this excuse every, to, to justify sin, to get drunk, to be a drunkard. 1 Timothy 5.23, a lot of us know this one. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmity. I mean, ignore the, word, the fact that it says little wine and it's for your stomach's sake when you have a stomach problem. Okay, you're sick. Okay. Uh, then they'll grab Proverbs 31, 6, and 7. Give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of a heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. I, I, that was a shock to me because I've never had someone who's justified drunkenness use that on me until this person came into my life and used it. Okay. Oh, we're allowed to. They use these. Okay. And you're like, okay, well, let's see what Scripture says, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay, context is everything. All right. You have Proverbs 31, 6 and 7 that, that they read to you. But what about Proverbs 22, 20, 29? Let's read about an example of what drunkenness is. Okay, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? who hath redness of eyes. I want to put that in there. When you see people, oftentimes, I've noticed with this person that came into my life, they like they had to have sunglasses, and they'd wear sunglasses indoors, and they wear sunglasses where they don't need sunglasses. Why is that? Well, you read right there, who hath redness of eyes. They're hung over. A lot of times you'll see people wear sunglasses when there's no reason to be wearing sunglasses because they're hung over. Not all the time, but with this person that came into my life, that's why that person wore sunglasses all the time. It was because they were trying to hide the red eyes. Verse 30. They, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go up seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it is giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. 
I've noticed this at the last. When you first start drinking, it, I, I've gotten drunk before. It doesn't hurt when you're getting drunk. It's afterwards. That's when it stings. Okay. Thine eye shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. With this person that was in my life, when they got drunk and I tried to preach the Word of God to them, they're professing to be saved. I preached the Word of God to them. I preached Jesus. I'd sing hymns to them. And uh, they didn't like it. They said some very perverse things about the Lord Jesus Christ and His perfect written Word. Amen. And they would flirt, this person would flirt with other men to try to, with men, to try to get free stuff. Okay, where it talks about strange women, a woman that gets drunk, it can be the same way. They flirt with these men to get free stuff, to have a good time and everything. It works both ways. Okay. Verse 34, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. Okay, so I want to get some people get drunk because they claim they have excuses. My whole body is in pain, so when I get drunk, I don't feel anything. You've had people that get drunk, and they get in fights, and they don't feel anything until the next day. I felt it not. When shall I awake? The next day. What happens when you awake? I will seek it yet again. It's an addiction. It destroys your life. It destroys you. Perfect, you utter perverse things. Okay? It'll destroy your life. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Turn to 1 Peter 5.8. It says there... Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, we throw these verses at these people saying, hey, we're supposed to be sober. Look how bad it is to be drunk. We're supposed to be sober. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse, Proverbs 23, 29 comes before Proverbs 31. Proverbs 21 comes before Proverbs uh, 31. Okay, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. I'm going to read that. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Is not wise. And you show them scripture after scripture after scripture. Drunkenness is not good. Giving in and being addicted to wine and strong drink, you're not wise. You're a fool. Okay? The opposite of being wise. Ephesians, what, the reason I did that verse is because you turn to Ephesians 5.17. Get into the New Testament. It says, Wherefore be ye not unwise. What did we just read in Proverbs 21 1? Deceived thereby and is not wise. Anybody that gets drunk is not wise. They're unwise. Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding that the will but understanding what the will of the Lord is. If you're a drunkard, you're not going to understand what the will of the Lord is. You're going to make a mess of scripture, and you're going to have those people that just keep coming back. But I am obeying the word of God. But I am obeying the word. I do it because I have this, uh, I have sorrows, and I've got a heavy heart. And, you know, I, I'm allowed to have a little wine. See, it says I have a little, and you say, and you get the context, you compare scripture with scripture, and they keep coming back with, I am obeying the word of God. They'll never understand what the will of God is. And as I read this verse, let's read the next part, verse 18 in Ephesians 5. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to stop there. When you truly are born again, you've come to God truly broken with godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is sorrow towards God. Worldly sorrow is sorrow towards the world. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. Who are you sorry to for your sins? Are you sorry to God? When you come to God broken, true repentance that leads to real belief. <coughs> sorry. I say real, but belief in your heart. Down there. Belief in your heart. Okay? And you come to God broken, and God saves you. One of the first things He's going to get out of your life, brothers and sisters in Christ, is drunkenness. 
Now, how many brethren out there can put in the comments, Amen. They had drunkenness in their life. They were drunkards before they got saved. God got that out of their life. God will get sodomy out of your life. I've heard testimony of some people who used to be sodomites, uh, used to be drunkards, foul language, using the Lord's name in vain. There's certain things that God, your, your whole life changes quick. There's certain things where there's a big change at the beginning, and then there's change continuously as you go on in your life as a Christian. One of the things He's going to get out of your life is drunkenness. Why? Because the Holy Spirit comes in. He gives you understanding what the will of the Lord is. If you're a drunkard, you can't have that understanding. Okay? He gets that out so you can understand this, so God can continue to clean up your life and sanctify your life and get your right, get your heart right with the with Him, the Lord. Now we read up there in Proverbs 31, 6 that their solution when it says, Give strong drink unto him that's ready to perish. If someone's ready to perish, their solution is strong drink. And wine unto them that be of a heavy heart. So if they have a heavy heart, their solution is wine. Okay? Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. What's the New Testament solution? Verse 19, Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's the solution. I sung hymns to this person. Okay, I quoted the word of the Lord to this person. I tried to encourage this person to get that out of your life. God can do it. it can, you can do all things through Christ, through Christ, which strengthens me. Okay, I know I'll get it. People get on to me because I get on to them when they say, "Well, I've been saved for five years, and I'm still I've been smoking for five years, and I, I can't seem to get this smoking out of my life." You're not going through Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Okay? There's so many testimonies of people that God got cigarettes out of their life, He got alcohol out of their life, He got video games, movies, and TV shows out of their life, He got fornication out of their life, sodomy out of their life, whatever. They truly are born again. Their heart's desire is 100% for Jesus Christ, and God got them out of their life. It might have taken some time. I'm not saying everything happens instantly, but there's some things that I believe does. Drunkenness is one of them. Okay, God will get that out of your life quick. There is no, I've been saved for 15, 20 years, but I'm a drunkard, and I've been a drunkard for 15, 20 years. Uh, no. Okay? The Holy Spirit, but be filled with the Holy Spirit we read there. But what's the solution? What do I always tell the brethren? You get tempted and things aren't going right in life, sorrows or whatever, what do you do? Hymns. Start singing old hymns. Start quoting scripture. Start reading the word of God. Do Bible studies. Walk and talk with the Lord. Okay? Start going through, I even mentioned going through and giving thanks. Give God thanks for everything. Look at your life and what God has done for you. You might have some things in your life that's fallen apart because of the world and the ways of the world, but look at everything else that God has given you and give God thanks for everything. Okay. That helps. Okay. And it says, Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Fellowship. True fellowship with the brethren. We're to hold each other accountable to this word. We're to encourage people to stand for this word. Okay. That's what that's there. Being submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Brother, God, I fear the Lord. We're in these last days. I have what I have here is a blessing from the Lord. The Lord can take it from me like that. Chastisement can come just like that. Do I want to lose everything here? No. If God takes it because He wants, you know, He takes it, it's His. But I'm talking about when it comes to chastisement, the fear of the Lord. God could take everything away. I could be living out of my truck tomorrow, especially with everything that's going on with the vaccines and everything. There's some of us that uh, we have retirements through government, and if the government says you have to take that mar uh, mark, well, I mean, if you have to take that vaccine, <laughs> it's not the mark, but you know what I'm saying, you have to take that vaccine, I could lose my retirement. I have to start making the income elsewhere, and I might end up losing this. All right. Chastisement, okay? We're supposed to fear the Lord. We're supposed to fear chastisement. When we read the story about Saul, uh, King Saul, where was the fear of the Lord? Where was it? 
when you come in front of somebody with drunkenness, where is the fear of the Lord to somebody that keeps coming back and saying, but I am obeying the word of God, but I am obeying the word of God. Where's the fear? There's no fear there. Okay. And they don't understand the will of the Lord. Just be sober, be vigilant, be not drunken. Time and time again. It's just in one ear, out the other. And they have to change the scriptures to try to justify their sin. That's one area in my life I use an example that you've come across people that no matter how much scripture you quote, they, they will, it's weird, not weird. Here's a way to say it. Before they sin, they have the attitude, but I am obeying the word of God. Then after they sin, oh yeah, I sin. Just like Saul, I sinned. But, you know, you, because know how he threw it back in Saul, Samuel's face, but it's your God, I'm doing this for your God, sacrificing the animals and everything to your God. He point, tried to point the finger back at Saul, or Samuel. Saul tried to point the finger back at Samuel. Two S's, <laughs> trying to get the names in order. They'll do the same to you and me, brothers and sisters in Christ. You point out something with them, they'll turn around and try to point the finger right back at you. Yeah, I did sin last night. Yeah, I got drunk last night. But you are no better than I am. You are just as much as a sinner as I am. So they acknowledge they sin, but they get defensive like they're defending that sin, and they point the finger at you. And then that next night, when they want to get drunk again, they go back to, but I am obeying the Word of God. No, you're not, but I am obeying the Word of God. It's the same people as we see King Saul here. They're called, I call, call them King Saul's. Okay? And it's just, it's frustrating, brother and sister Christ, when you're trying to deal with someone, especially someone you love. The person I'm talking about, I loved. They didn't love the Lord, and they didn't love me. And some of you have family members out there, uh, friends, neighbors, that, that you care about, and you try to preach the gospel to them. But I'm talking about someone who's professing to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing person. And no matter, I mean, I just, I really tried and it broke my heart that they chose the flesh and the world over everything. Just like Saul did, King Saul did. The next thing we're going to talk about real quick that I hear, that you hear a lot about the I am, I am, and then they have to add to the word of God, and then they go back to the I am, I am, and it's just a circular thing. Just constantly, I am obeying the word of God, I am, and you show them in scripture, you know you're not, but I am, no you're not, but I am. And you can get stuck in that loop with them. We'll talk about what to do at the end of this study. You can get stuck in that loop with them, but you're not supposed to. But you can notice these people that when you realize it's just a loop, it's like a broken record, these people are mentally ill, they just love their sin over the word of the Lord, what do you do? Well, if you've followed my ministry long enough, you already know the answer to that. Preach the God, the plan of salvation and move on. But the next one I want to talk about is liberty, how people... The number one, what I've noticed, the number one reason people mess up liberty, what liberty is in the Bible for a New Testament Christian, the number one reason they mess it up is because they have sin in their life that they're trying to justify. So the number one reason they mess up liberty. That's found. I'm, reach, I'm looking over here, reaching over here. The Bible says this is sin, and they, they want to try to justify sin. They want to be one of those people that says, I am obeying the word of God. I am obeying the word of God. So what do they do? They try to hide that sin under liberty. And they, may, they have to change the definition of what the Bible talks about, of what liberty is for a New Testament Christian. Okay. So first, I want to get it, liberty in its simplest form. And I've been told I'm adding to Scripture. I'm adding to Scripture. And I'll be coming out with some Bible studies on... Uh, the brethren as a whole, they're trying to push this. There's three things we can agree to disagree on. And after looking into them, uh, they're not a liberty issue. They can become a liberty issue, but they're not. They have nothing to do with liberty. Okay? But that'll be a whole other study. But right now, Romans 8.2. Turn to Romans 8.2. Liberty is being liberated from a law that is in place. That's what liberty is. Okay? It's freedom from a law that constrains you, holds you in place. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What's liberty for a New Testament Christian? You've been freed from the law of sin and death. 
I had a, a brother in Christ tell me that the uh, Old Testament laws, Levitical laws, have nothing to do with the New Testament Christian liberty for a New Testament Christian. And my mouth almost dropped. I couldn't believe he said that. Okay. The law of sin and death. The, uh, the wages of sin is death. The letter killeth. What's the letter talking about in the Bible when it says the letter killeth? The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You've sinned against God, you are going to hell. That's the law of sin and death. Yeah, but I, what, what if I give you all my money? What if I give you all my possessions? What if I sacrifice this? Or do, what if I do Nope. The law is the law. You've sinned against God, you are going to hell. That's your destination. That's the law of sin and death. What happens when you get saved? Jesus Christ has liberated you from the law of sin and death. You have liberty in Christ Jesus. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, the sting, of death, or the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Okay? Yes, the New Testament liberty uh, for a New Testament Christian does have to do with the Old Testament Levitical laws. The do's and the don'ts. You, they were there to show that you're a sinner. That you've sinned against God. They're a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Who can liberate you from the law of sin and death and give you liberty? Jesus Christ can. Okay? Galatians 2.4 and that because of false brethren unaware brought in who came in to privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. I've already done a lot of studies, so I'm not going to go in depth with verse after verse. I've already done studies comparing scripture with scripture. But brothers and sisters in Christ, when the Bible's talking about liberty for a New Testament Christian, what's it talking about? It's talking about someone comes in and tries to get you back under the law of sin and death. They try to bring you back into bondage, saying, if you've sinned once, you've lost your salvation. Okay? They've come in to spy out your liberty, which you have in Christ Jesus. The liberty there isn't freedom to sin. It's saying that when you sin, you don't go to hell. God's liberated you from the law of sin and death. Okay? You have eternal security. Another way to look at it is when someone comes in to try to steal your liberty, which you have in Christ Jesus, they're trying to say that you're not eternally secure. They're trying to steal your assurance of salvation, eternal security. Okay? You're sealed into the day of redemption. But some people will use that as the Bible. See, you're just... Uh, Spy out our liberty. You're a liberty thief. You're a liberty thief. I am obeying the word of the Lord. You're a liberty thief. Brothers and sisters of Christ, liberty in its simplest form. When you're going through, when I've done my studies, as I continue to study, God shows me more. Bottom line, what it's talking about is people try to say, if you're not keeping this law, this Old Testament law, you're lost. You've lost your salvation. And, and you're like, they're coming out to take your liberty away, which you have in Christ Jesus. You're freed from the law of sin and death. You can't go back under the law of sin and death. You cannot lose your salvation. And that's what they're trying to do. That's what liberty is for a New Testament Christian. When God saves you, you are saved. Period. Now let's look at some of the excuses. 1 Corinthians 10, 29. Something that these people will say. They'll try to say I'm a liberty thief when I tell them and call them out on their sin and they try to hide sin. Some of the th things that people try to hide under liberty, I haven't even mentioned some of those. Uh, holidays is a big one. They try to ha hide that under things that we can agree to disagree on. They try to make that out. That's what liberty is, that things that we can agree to disagree on. No, it isn't. Okay. I have a brother in Christ that anytime somebody mentions holiday, he'll, he'll go in and say holy day. Because you ask people, chapter and verse on the word holiday, it's not in scripture. You won't find holiday in scripture, okay? That's not a liberty. It can become a liberty issue if someone says you have to keep this holiday. It's supposed to be holy day, okay? Holy day and the Sabbath days, okay? They're Old Testament 
things where they were commanded that they had to observe those things. And if they failed to observe those things, they were not right with the Lord. They'd be stoned, they'd be killed. In other words, they'd lose their salvation. Okay? That's Old Testament Levitical laws. Today, if you want to keep those, fine. If you don't, you don't. But you've got people who want to keep holidays, not holy days, man-made holidays, and try to hide it under liberty. What they're doing is paganism. They're worshiping false gods. They're doing bad things. And you, we quote scripture to them. Christmas, sinful and wicked. Where's Christmas at in the Bible? It's not there. That's all that needs to be said. Get it out of your life. Period. End of discussion. Get it out of your life. It's not in scripture. Right. But they try to hide it under liberty. Uh, video games. The biggest thing that happened uh, was a group of brethren broke off. Some, I believe, were saved that are being deceived by good words and fair speeches because they're not staying in the Word of God. They become simple because they're not hiding God's Word in their heart and continuing to live God's Word. But a lot of them are false that are branching off and going that way. Why is that? Because they're trying to hide video games Hollywood movies and TV shows, anime, satanic style music, they're trying to hide all that stuff under liberty. And no matter how much we try to say, abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. I keep putting my hand on the Bible. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Okay? Uh, vain imagination. You're not supposed to have vain imagination. You're supposed to hide God's word in your heart. Your life's supposed to be about things that are real and important. You know, what's in front of you not a vain imagination okay no matter what we do they come back with excuses first Corinthians 10 29 conscience I say not thine own but of the other for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience and after God opened my heart and I start looking at that what's going on there it's talking about meats someone I'll use this as an example I'm sitting here and I start eating pork someone out there is trying to grab the Old Testament Levitical laws and saying you're not supposed to eat pork. That's unclean. And because you ate that, you've lost your salvation. Why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? It's not based off Scripture anymore because when you say, well, we've got to compare Scripture with Scripture, the Old Testament, they weren't allowed to. Why? Because their body and their soul was connected. Today we have spiritual circumcision. Our body and soul is not connected. And God's even come through and said, all things are clean when you give God thanks for it. Natural foods. All things are clean. We show scripture to them, but they come back with their conscience and try to tell you, I don't think you're saved because you're eating. They judge your salvation based on something the Bible says is okay now. That's what's going on there. But they'll come back with that, that thing. Why is my uh, liberty judged of another man's conscience? I told this group of people that were defending all this sin, and when I proved them wrong there, what did they do? They ran to 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 1 Corinthians 10, 23. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, And all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Then they jump down to 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and say, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. All things are lawful for me. I can, I can sin. Evidently, sin gets thrown under that all things are lawful. So now sin is somehow lawful to them, even though the Bible is 100% against sin. Zero tolerance for sin. All sin is negative. But all of a sudden, sin gets put under there. You'll get these people like King Saul that say, like a broken record, you're just a liberty thief. I have liberty in Christ Jesus. You're here to spy out my liberty and steal my liberty. You're here... Uh, to judge, you're judging my liberty of your own conscience. Uh, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me. And no matter how much scripture I tried to show them as a, at the time, I was acting like a bro treating them like a brother and trying to quote scripture to them. But you get to a point where that circular, they just keep coming back with that circular. When I proved everything wrong, the only thing that they could hold on to was all things are lawful for me. All of a sudden, sin became lawful to them. That's how mentally... the off they are, okay? This think that sin is now lawful, okay? There are certain things that were changed in the Old Testament. You have to prove it through Scripture, okay? It says you couldn't do it in the Old Testament. Now you can. Where does it say it in the New Testament? There has to be a change. If there's no change, it's the same, okay? 
But liberty, remember, brother, sister Christ, liberty for a New Testament Christian is that when you get saved, it's because Jesus has liberated you by God's grace. That's how you were saved. You were liberated from the law of sin and death. You're no longer going to hell. You're going to heaven. You have liberty in Christ Jesus. I have failed the Lord. I have fallen flat on my face. And I was wrong. It is wrong. Sin is wrong. All sin is negative. I need to deny myself, pick up my cross, and get back to following the Lord. But when I fall flat on my face, I didn't lose my salvation. There's the liberty. That's what the Bible's talking about when it comes to liberty. Okay? That's it. When someone tries to hide sin under liberty, they'll never get that. They'll never get it. Okay? They'll always try to mess up liberty. Liberty means that we're free to do this and we're free to do that, and it's okay in God's eyes. It's okay. We can just all agree to disagree. That's not what liberty is. And with these people, you just keep talking to them and keep talking to them. And no matter how much scripture you quote, uh, 1 Peter 2.16, As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servant of God. They don't seem to like that one. Okay, you're freed from the law of sin and death, but you're not to use it for your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. It's not justification to sin. The Bible says, are we to sin that grace may abound? How are you saved from the law of sin and death? By God's grace. Are we supposed to continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Why? Because we're the servants of God now. We're not servants of the flesh. We went from being carnally minded and walking after the flesh, being servants of the flesh, the servants of sin, to being spiritually, capital S, spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. In other words, God comes in and tells you what to do, and you do it. And we're servants of God. Okay. You're not supposed to use the fact that you're eternally secure as justification for sin. Period. And that's what these people are doing. They're trying to hide it under liberty. Their sin under liberty. Romans 6.1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How will we the dead to sin live any longer therein? That's Romans 6.1, the address. 2 Peter 2.19 says, While they promise them liberty, you have false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, going around promoting false plan of salvation, a false Jesus preaching another Jesus, another gospel, getting people to receive another spirit, an antichrist spirit. What's going on? They're promising them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption from whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. They tell you that you can have the world and be a Christian. They promise them liberty, eternal security, but you can have this world too. And what happens? That person is brought back into the same bondage. They're still under the law of sin and death. They have not been freed from it. They don't have liberty in Christ Jesus. They're not saved. You cannot have this world and Jesus Christ. You cannot have both. Romans 6.18 says, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Remember the Bible says, There's none righteous, no, not one. Okay, who's the righteousness here? Become the servant of righteousness. The Holy Spirit comes in, you become spiritually minded, capital S Spirit, and you walk after the Spirit. Jesus said, I will come to you. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit being brought to you. Jesus is the only righteousness. His righteousness is imputed to us. It's Jesus Christ that we're the servants of. What did we read up there? Servants of God. Okay. Romans 6.20 says, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Two verses down. Okay? You can be the servants of God, righteousness, or you can be the servants of sin. You can't be both. And you get these people, just to round it up, because I didn't want to do a huge thing, but round it up. Uh, these people, no matter how much you try to quote this to them, you don't have justification of sin. These people have chosen those things over fellowship with the brethren. They've chosen Christmas over fellowship with the brethren. They've chosen video games, movies, and TV shows over fellowship with the brethren. Over their walk with the Lord. Okay? They've chosen these things. 
And no matter how much you preach to them, it's like a broken record. But I am obeying the Word of God. But I am obeying the Word of God. But I am obeying the Word of God. When they're not. You can prove to them not. And I say this with frustration because there's brethren out there that I believe are saved because that's why I said keep in mind everything we're talking about. You guard your heart and you look at yourself first before you say, yeah, I've, I've experienced that with other people. What about your own life first? I believe there's some brethren out there that are struggling with this. Uh, try, they are so desperate to hide their sin that they make a mess of God's word trying to hide their sin. They don't want their sin to be brought to light. So what do they do? They try to put the spotlight on you. You, tell, you put the spotlight on me. I, I have sinned. I still make mistakes. Okay? I, I do. But I get frustrated because there's brethren out there that I love and care about, and I keep preaching scripture after scripture. You need to get that Christmas out of your life. Stop inviting Satan into your home every year. Okay? You need to get those video games out of your life. You need to get those Hollywood movies and TV shows. And I'm talking to myself. I never had a problem with addiction to, uh, to Christmas. Some people are addicted to Christmas for some reason. Well, it's a flesh holiday. It's about yourself. It's not about Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form. They try to hide it behind Jesus Christ, but it's about yourself and your flesh. I've never been addicted to that. I'm talking to myself when I'm telling you guys to get those Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games out of your life. Anime, out of your life. I don't have a problem with being addicted anymore to secular style music, but you need to get that secular style music out of your life. Okay? It's a plea from the brethren. Okay, but you've got certain people that they, we're going to get to the verses that talk about how they're lovers of their flesh more than they're lovers of God. They love God, but they love their flesh more. And they're not going to listen to us. It's like a broken record. But I am obeying the Word of God. But I am obeying the Word of God. Look at me. I'm going to add to the Word of God. I'm going to take the Word of God out of context just so it can make it look like I am obeying the Word of God. Okay. The next one, I didn't want to need to go into that for that long, but the gospel, okay, the plan of salvation, obeying the gospel. We're going to read three things real quick. Question I'm going to ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ, why did Jesus die on the cross? Most people will answer, well, he died for my sins. Okay, then the next question you'd ask, are you going to continue in sin? Well, now you're trying to teach works-based salvation, then why did Jesus die on the cross for you? you rinse and repeat. Why did Jesus die on the cross for you? Well, he died for my sins. Are you going to continue there? Then? Well, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, we can still be carnal. You can be a carnal. Then why did Jesus die for you? And it gets to the point where you have to realize Jesus didn't die for that person. Okay? Not yet. Okay? He died for the sins of the world as a whole, but that person's still going to have to answer for their sins at the judgments, at the great white throne. Not the judgment. Judgment seat of Christ for saved. At the great white throne, they're going to still be answering for their sins. Jesus didn't pay for it. They will be paying for it. Okay? If it gets to that circular reason. But right here, obeying the gospel. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? The gospel is something you have to obey. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And works, I see, they profess that they know me, but in works they deny me, being abominable and disobedient unto every good works, reprobate. Mm -hmm. They profess that they know God. That's what means being God. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. They don't know God, and they, obey, they don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They skip repentance. I, I, that's the number one thing that people keep getting tripped on. These people that they want to go to heaven, they want eternal life, they want to get promised liberty, but their flesh is what they want more. They want their flesh more. They can't bring themselves to truly repent and have godly sorrow, sorrow towards God for their personal sins that they sinned against Him. They never come to that point. 1 Peter 4.17 And obeying the gospel proof, because you're supposed to prove your own selves, evidence that you've obeyed the gospel is the changed life. I want to please God. It's 100% about Jesus Christ. I want my heart right with the Lord. I want to please Him. Sin doesn't please God. Sin is what got me in this mess to begin with. Sin is why Jesus died on the cross for me in the first place. I don't want sin in my life. 
the changed life after salvation. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God, and it first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? People always okay, see. People always grab 1 Corinthians 15, um, 1 through 4. Well, what does it say in verse 2? You can believe in vain. It's just up here. You can believe in vain. It's worthless. You're still going to hell. You believe the gospel, but you're still going to hell. Why? You refused to repent. That belief is up here. It's not down here. And it'll never, ever make it down here if you skip repentance. True biblical repentance. Just saying I'm a sinner is not true biblical repentance. Confessing your lost sinful state is not true biblical repentance. What does God's word say? Godly sorrow worketh repentance. You want that repentance to work? You have to have sorrow towards God, your creator, for sinning against him. Your personal sins. You look at the life that you're living when you first got saved. I looked at the life that I was living and I was sinful. It was wicked. I had sinned against my creator, God Almighty, Jesus Christ. You never get to that point. You're never getting saved. It's that simple. You will never believe in your heart and truly understand in your heart what Jesus did for you. Why is that? Because you look at these people. There doesn't have to be a changed life. You don't need repentance. You don't need prayer. It's only belief. Even though 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 2, or verse 2, says that you can believe in vain. If it's only belief, then you can believe in vain. It doesn't make sense unless you compare Scripture with Scripture. It makes perfect sense. Your belief is just in your head. You refused repentance. And no matter how much we preach the true plan of salvation to these people, they keep coming circular reasoning, but I am obeying the gospel. I am obeying the, the word of God. And they pick and choose what verses they want and throw everything out. And people keep saying, that is Paul reiterating the gospel. You can find the gospel in Romans. Okay? That's in Corinthians. People always grab it. That's the gospel. That's, the go that's Paul preaching the gospel again the people he's to professing Christians and that's what people don't seem to get he's not preaching that gospel it's the same gospel for the lost as it is for us to say but you understand what I'm saying brother and sister Christ he's preaching it to people who are professing to be saved he's not going out to professingly lost people and preaching that okay he's preaching it to saved people who are professing to be saved professing to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, and he's telling them, I don't think you're saved. Here's the, here's the plan of salvation. Here's the gospel. Okay? And he talks about it throughout all of 1 and 2 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. But once again, you get across those people, those King Saul's, but I am obeying the word of God, but I am obeying the word of God. No, what they're really doing is they're denying the word of God and in turn, they're denying Jesus Christ. Saul was denying God by denying his command. So God denied him. It's that simple, brethren. When you get people to preach the gospel and move on, they deny the word of God, they're denying God. And guess what? God's going to deny them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, the work is reprobate. I never knew you. Okay, now, those are three examples I've got that recently just really come to mind of what I struggle with some of the false converts out there and among some of the brethren. This, but God will get them straight. God will get them straightened out. He won't let them be like that for years and years and years. God will get them straightened out in these areas. Um, but... Yeah, it's just you get those people, brother, sister Christ, that no matter how much you try to quote scripture to them, it, it's circular reasoning. But I am obeying the word of God. But I am obeying the word of God. And you get to a point where you're like, they're not saved. You just get in your heart and say, Lord, there's, they just can't be saved at this point. Not can't be saved like, I'm talking about present tense, they can't be saved. Future tense, anybody can get saved. But right now, they're not saved, Lord. How could they just deny your word? How could they think dream drunk is okay? How can they justify wicked video games? All video games are meant to be addictive, vain imagination. They're all sinful. 
okay? Video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows, anime, uh, satanic style music, you know, trying to justify fornication, trying to justify adultery. Okay. Had that happen in my life recently. Someone tried to justify adultery, uh, fornication, and all this stuff. How can you do that as a saved sinner with the Holy Spirit in you? Where's the conviction? Where's the chastisement? Okay. Now, here's the thing. We need to be careful not to be quick to judge. Did, did uh, God just throw Sam, uh, King Saul out on one thing? In the Old Testament, he did a lot one thing, but it wasn't one thing. Okay. Uh, was this the first time Saul did this? Disobeyed God's command and tried to justify it? And say he is. Uh, 1 Samuel 13, 1. Let's go back. 1 Samuel 13, 1. First time Saul actually disobeyed God and his command. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him, and Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering, and it came to pass, as soon as he had made end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Saul, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him. Saul went out to meet him. Or Samuel went out, Saul went out to meet him. Is Saul, Saul is a Benj, part of the uh, tribe of Benjamin. He's not a Levite. He just disobeyed God's word. Let's look at his attitude, that he might salute him. And Samuel, that he might salute him. What's up, brother? How's it going? Like nothing's wrong. Verse 11. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the, Philist that the Philistines gathered themselves to together at Mishmash. Mishmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilead. He's justifying his sin. And I had not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore. I forced myself, therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel's forever, but now, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. A man after his own heart. A man whose heart is for the Lord. Saul, his head. Head knowledge. But his heart wasn't for the Lord. King David's was. Our, we're supposed to strive to be King David's, but how many King Saul's have we come across? A lot. I mean, I'm talking about, it's, it's, it's a frustrating, I'm not talking about just the Bible, people who profess to be Bible believing Christians. I mean, Christians, period. All these false Christians, false Bible perversions, these Babel buildings and everything. How many King Saul's do we come across? There are so many, I can't even count. Over half the world's population, and that's not documenting everybody, but because they don't, they can't get everybody. But they say over the ones they've documented, over half the world's population believes in a Jesus Christ. King Saul's. But very few of them believe in the Jesus Christ, King David. Words here. Okay. That wasn't the first time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm not quick to judge somebody when I see sin in their life. Okay? I go to talk to them about that sin. Hey, God's word says it's a sin. Now at that point. What's their heart towards it? Their heart is for their flesh. Their mind is for the Lord. So they're going to try to, to justify that sin. I'll question their salvation. Paul did that to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He questioned their salvation time and time and time again. I mean, just read through a lot of ifs. If a man be called a brother, check whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. He turns around and preaches the gospel to him again. Okay, what's your heart? Is your heart for the Lord, or is it for your sin? Are you a servant of God, or are you a servant of sin? A servant of righteousness over a servant of unrighteousness. Right? Now, 
Here we're going to get into it. You come across these people. Samuel was dealing with Saul, someone he loved and cared about. How do we know this? Okay, 1 Samuel 15, 35. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. He didn't want anything to do with him. But here's it. But nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Samuel mourned for Saul. Okay? When you're dealing with these people, your love for them, you're going to help them out. You're supposed to try to point them to Scripture. You're supposed to try to point them to the Word of God. But when you realize that you get stuck with those King Saul people, that it's circular, I'm trying to do a circle, <laughs> to me it's circular, but a circle, it's circular, they just keep coming back to, but I am obeying the Word of God. No, you're not, and you show them the Scripture. And, but I am obeying the Word of God. They've got excuses. They twist Scripture. They take Scripture out of context. They don't compare Scripture with Scripture. But I am obeying the Word of God. And they won't listen. What do you do? 1 Samuel 16, 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. You have to get to a point, brothers and sisters of Christ, where you go, okay, I'm done. Here's the plan of salvation. Take it or leave it. And oftentimes they'll say, leave it. Then you're done with them. Move on. That's why I put Brother Brian's video up on my channel recently about um, moving on to another city. Oh, let them alone. Let them alone. Okay? They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they will both fall into a ditch. Let them alone. Okay? Preach the plan of salvation to them. Treat them like they're lost. They might still be saved, but you treat them like they're lost. You preach the plan of salvation to them, and you move on. The Bible talks about how you're supposed to be treated as a heathen and a publican. When someone's in sin, and they've wronged the brethren, or they've wronged God, His Word, and he's been corrected by, let's say I corrected him, then I go with some brethren to correct him, then the church as a whole corrects him, they refuse to repent, their sin is more important than the word of God, their sin is more important than fellowship with the brethren. The Bible says they're to be treated as a heathen and a publican. You treat them like a lost person. Here's the plan of salvation, be gone. I'm not fellowshipping with you anymore. You don't fellowship with lost people. They're to be treated as lost people. You don't fellowship with them anymore. Okay? There gets a point where you've got to say, enough's enough. I'm not going to get drawn into arguments. I'm not going to get drawn into debates. Debating is a sin. Arguing the Word of God. We're to discuss the Word of God, not argue. Okay? That's the contention. Okay? We're supposed to discuss the Word of God. Encourage one another with the Word of God. When you find that that's going on, they're not listening, they just want to debate and argue, and their goal is to try to pull you away from the Word of God, and they're trying to treat you like someone who's a babe in Christ or a sucker, like King Saul tried to treat Samuel. Hey, how's it going, brother? Blessings be to you. Uh, he knew what he did was wrong. These people know they're wrong. But they're trying to hide their sin behind the Word of God. And it doesn't work. It never works. God's Word is 100% against sin. All sin is negative. All right. 2 Timothy 3.1 You get these people. Now I wanted to explain this. 2 Timothy 3.1 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. They love their flesh. They love their sin. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. You call them out on their sin, they'll turn around and try to point the finger at you. Sometimes they're pointing out sin that I do that I've done in the past or I am doing and I have to clean that sin up but they're always trying to point the finger elsewhere and oftentimes it's false accusing it's to make everyone else look bad so they look good incontinent fierce despisers of those that are good they'll wind up despising you traitors I'm sorry anybody that, that says the they, they're falling away and they start joining the enemy, they're traitors. Oftentimes people say that, that if it goes that far that they join the enemy, they're traitors. They were never saved to begin with. If they were of us, they would remain with us. But they went out from us because they were not of us. I'm kind of butchering that 
forgive me, Lord and brothers and sisters of Christ. I don't have it in my notes. You know what I'm saying? Traitors, heady, high-minded. It's up here. High-minded. I know what I'm talking about, but it's not down here. They're not living it. Lovers of pleasures. Here's the key for this whole thing. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Notice it says more than. It doesn't say they love their pleasures and they hate God. They are lover, lovers of pleasures more than they love God. And that's what these people are. In certain areas of their life, there's still areas in their life where they are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in your life, is there areas in your life that you are failing and you're being lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? God's Word says it's wrong. It's not based in Scripture. If you're doing something that's not based in Scripture and you're claiming you're doing it for Jesus Christ, you know, King Saul claimed he was doing it for Jesus, for God, but he was disobeying God. Okay? Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. A form of godliness. Remember, it says you can have good works and fair speeches. Why not go to say? Uh, your works are reprobate. Okay? They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. And then it says that their works are reprobate. They profess that here's Titus one sixteen. They profess that they know God, but but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Good work. They're doing good work according to Scripture. Sacrificing animals is a good work. But it's reprobate because God commanded Saul to kill everything, destroy everything. None of it's good. God didn't want those as sacrifices. He didn't want that. But is sacrificing to the Lord good in the Old Testament? Yeah. Today, there's a lot of things that people do. Is reading the Bible a good thing? Yeah. It becomes um, reprobate when you're not living it. It's worthless. There's no point in you reading this book if you're not going to live it and put it in here. That's what it means by hiding God's word in your heart. It means you're living it. It's not just head knowledge. You're living it. You care about God's word that you want to have it in your life and apply it to your life in every way, shape, or form. Having a form of godliness. They do good things and profess to be saved, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What's going on? They offer you liberty, but they themselves are the servants of unrighteousness. Back in the, in the we talked about liberty where Second uh, Peter two nineteen, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. That's what's going on here. There's people that have a love of God, but they love their flesh more than they love God, and they've made their decision, they've chosen their flesh over Jesus Christ. And they have good words and fair speeches. Circular reason, but I am obeying the word of God. But I am obeying the word of God. No, you're not. Romans 1.21 Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. What did we read? They love their flesh more than they love the Lord. Okay, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. I use that for that study about you're supposed to not have vain imagination. All vain imagination is vain. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like uncorruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They've got to bring Jesus down to their level to justify sin. Jesus isn't up here, he's down here. And ultimately, they're putting them below themselves. They're the ones that are the gods. They're their, they're, are their own gods, knowing good and evil. 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. But I am obeying the word of God. You show them time and time again, you're not and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. Let that sink in, who is blessed forever. Amen. More than the Creator. They worship and serve the creature 
more than the Creator. In other words, they're worshiping and serving the Creator, but they're worshiping and serving their flesh more. And that's what you get from these King Saul people. It's all about the flesh. It's all about sin. I'll give up this over here because I want to give it up. This over here the Bible condemns, I'm keeping it. See, I've had a changed life. I've given this stuff up. You look at their life as a whole. Well, what about this sin? What about that sin? Well, I ain't giving that up. I ain't giving that up. Okay? I've had, I have a lost neighbor that got out of control with drunkenness. And now he's quit alcohol and he's been clean for a year and a half. Does that mean that he's, he's saved, he's had a changed life? He verbally rejects Jesus Christ, but I'm trying to point out that there's some things you can get rid of your life as a lost person because you choose to. But it's about the heart. Are you getting rid of it because God's Word says so? Yes, okay, then what about that other sin in your life that God's Word says is a sin? Christmas. Did you get that out of your life? Why not? Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. Why not? Porn. Why not? Satanic style music, anime, why haven't you got that stuff out of your life? Oh, but that's not a sin. That's not. A sin. That's okay. It's okay. There's justification for that stuff. They'll throw out stuff that's obvious, like porn. I know I threw porn in there, but they'll throw that stuff out because it's obviously wicked. But what about those Hollywood movies that promote porn? They're just porn of another version, another kind. What about those video games where it's immodest dressed women and men left and right? In a lot of the newest games, they have got cussing and sexual innuendos. It's the same thing. They put on a show. But when you back them up and you get them backed up in a corner with their sin that they're holding on to and keeping in their lives, what's their attitude? Who are you to judge me? You're just a sinner just like I am. You're no different than me. I'm not the one with the problem. You're the one with the problem. I am obeying the Word of God. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be follows together of me. Brethren, be follows together of me. I'm trying to set a good example as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man because I'm following the examples of brethren in the Bible. I'm following the ultimate example of Jesus Christ. But I'm doing my best to obey his word, to set a good example for the brothers and sisters in Christ. And I apologize when I fail. I owe God the apology first, then I owe the brethren the apology when I fall flat on my face. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which, have, which walk so as ye have us for an example. Why is that? Why am I telling you that you're supposed to... I used to be addicted to some of those stuff. I got drunk in my life, and I got into alcohol and in my lost life, and I gave it up, and I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want it in my life. Was I a hardcore drunkard? I said alcoholic again. Forgive me. Drunkard? I was a drunkard in my lost life. I gave it up as a lost professing Christian, a false convert. Okay? I never really struggled with it. But I did struggle with video games, movies, and TV shows and still struggle with that to this day. That temptation's always there, trying to pull me back into it. Just even saying it tempts me. <laughs> Philippians 3.17 it says, okay, why? Why are you supposed to follow my example and why are we, brothers and sisters of Christ, you out there, supposed to set the example for the brethren? It's not just me setting the example, you are too. And you're supposed to line up with this. And this is what you hold me accountable to and make sure I line up with this, the Word of God, King James Bible. Why? For many walk, of whom I have told you often, often, and now tell you even weeping. He's warned the brethren. I don't know how many times someone said, what do you think of this guy? This guy's teaches, and you ask them, do they use the King, are they King James Bible believers? No, he uses an NIV, then stay away from them. And then the guy comes back, well, this one guy, they're mentioning the exact same guy, he taught such as I said, why are you still listening to him? Stay away from him. Then they come back, did you know what this one guy did? I, I believe he could be saved, but stay away from him. If they're not a King James Bible believer, they're using Bible perversions, you stay away. But I think this is what Paul was fr frustrated with some of the brethren, it's because we warn you, and you ignore our warning, and you continue to do what you, and, and fellowship with lost people. You continue to watch ministries that are false, and you come up with excuses why you do it. 
Okay, have I told you often, and now I even tell you weeping. It's getting so bad that the brethren are falling away. We see more and more of them falling away. There's fewer and fewer Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women in the world today. Yes, weeping. If they don't use a King James Bible, dump them. When you find out that they're not really King James Bible believers, even though they claim to use this, but they're correcting the book, they're adding to the Word of God, they're subtracting from the Word of God, they're teaching things that are not found, the Trinity's not found in the Bible, replacement theology is not found in this book. Dump them. Stay away from them. All right? That you can lose your salvation when, in this dispensation, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. All right? Weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They're going to mess you up, brothers and sisters in Christ. Their goal is to prevent people from getting saved, and their goal is to ruin your testimony so God can't use you other than a, as a bad example. There's times where I've lost my testimony with people, and I was only used as a bad example. I actually hurt the cause of Christ. I wasn't helping it. All right? That's their goal. You've got to stay away from them. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay, shame is sin. If God's ashamed of you, it's because you've sinned against him. People always say when it comes to the long hair, if a man have long hair, it is a shame. It doesn't say sin. It's a sin for men to have long hair. They glory in their shame. They're glorying in their sin. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Hey, look, world, look at what I'm doing. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Look at me, look at me. And then they profess to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. And they're glorifying their shame, their sin. They're promoting their sin. They're getting other people to do those sin. They're causing brethren to stumble and fall back into those sins. That's their goal. Okay? You can glory in righteousness, Jesus Christ, or you can glory in shame, your sin. You can't do both. And these are the people that you're coming across, brother and sister Christ. These are these people. You look at them, and you underline them, and you're like, okay, that's what they are. They, they have a little bit of form of godliness. They, they say they love the Word. They obey the Word of God here and here, but over here they reject it. Someone who's truly saved is going to love the whole Word of God. Every Word of God is pure, tried in the fire seven times. They're going to do their best to obey all of God's commands. They're not going to justify sin whatsoever. Okay. Don't fall into the trap of justifying sin. Okay. Now, to wrap this up, remember, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Okay, You're going to come across King Saul's in the world. I'm sorry that this study was as long as it was, but you're going to come across King Saul's in the world. What do you do? Your first thing is, is you've got to try to preach the truth to them. You have to try. But when you realize that you're stuck in that loop that they're always going to come back with, but I am obeying the Word of God, but I am obeying the Word of God, and they're adding to the Word of God, they're subtracting from the Word of God, they're taking words out of context, they're not comparing Scripture with Scripture, and you're wasting your time at that point. You're casting pearls before swine. You have to get to the point where you say, enough's enough, here's the plan of salvation, I'm out. Take it or leave it. Well, yeah, but I got saved off that, did you? Did you really get saved off of that? Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Make sure you're not reprobates. Fake, false converts. Why are you defending sin? Why are you trying to change God's word into a lie? And so on and so forth. Brother says Christ, preach the gospel to them and move on. Do what Paul, what God told Samuel. Go to King David. Okay? Go to real brethren that love the Word of God. Fellowship with real brethren. Go to people that want to hear the Word. You start preaching the Word to this person, they don't want to hear it. The gospel, the plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God, to save you. He saves you, and then your life changes. God comes into your life. He's the one. He's your commander-in-chief. He tells you what to do, and you do it. You preach the plan of salvation to this person. 
They don't want it. You preach it. They don't want it. There comes a point where you got to stop being like Saul Samuel was. Not Saul, but Samuel. Mourning. I really want this person to get saved. They don't want to get saved. Go to somebody who does. Go to somebody whose heart is in the right place. They're ready for salvation. Today, finding that person is... It's like saying there's one needle in all the world and you've got to find that needle. That's what it feels like sometimes, trying to find that one person that their heart is in the right place. They want salvation. They want to truly be saved by God. Okay. And it's hard finding those people. But you've got to keep going. But when you get to the point where you realize that person, you preach the plan of salvation to that person, they don't want anything to do with the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, you move on. Stop mourning over them. Move on. So hopefully this is a long study. It's helped encourage the brethren to check your own lives, to make sure you're not being a King Saul and fall into a trap of being a King Saul, and to guard your heart and your walk with the Lord and your fellowship and make sure you're not fellowshipping with people that are King Saul's. Okay? These lost false converts. Make sure you're not being a King Saul and make sure that you have done your best to correct those King Saul's out there, then you preach the plan of salvation to those King Saul's out there, and then you're done with them. I'm done. You're done with them. Okay? So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.